Praise be to God. I come to bear witness that there is no other God but Jehovah, and that Jesus Christ is his only Son, a prophet, and Savior of the world, that there is no other name whereby men shall be saved but by and through the name of Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, the only Son of the most sovereign, omnipotent God, is Lord. Grace and mercy to the world and to my kingdom, brothers and sisters, peace be unto you and God be glorified. As we continue in this series, G5A, Grace, God, Unmerited Favor, um, the book of John tells us in John chapter 1, verse 17, as we open up with this grace series, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of grace. Paul preached the gospel of grace given to him by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul did not receive it of man, nor was he taught it by man, nor did he confer with man, nor tried to please man as he preached the liberation gospel of grace. Paul went on to say to the church of Galatia in Galatians 1 and uh, 6 through 9, he said, I marvel that ye so soon remove from him that call you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8, he says, but though we are angels from heaven, preach another gospel unto you than that which ye have we have preached unto you let him be a curse verse 9 he says as we said before so say i unto you let him be a curse so say I unto you now again if any man preach another gospel unto you than that ye have received let him be a curse. It's interesting that Paul says this twice. So if you're preaching something other than the gospel of grace, you can be double cursed. Ephesians 3, verse uh, 2 through 3 says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which is given me to you, Ward, how that by revelation he made known unto me, the mysteries, as I wrote afar in a few words. The gospel of grace must be preached to a hurting world to remind them that God loves them as he is always reaching for them. Thus, this series, G5A, God's Unmerited Favor. Grace, God's Unmerited Favor. As we continue in this series, go in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1, and we'll read verse 9, and there I will extract my text. John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, we'll be reading verse 9, and when you got it, just kindly say, I got it. Hallelujah. And the word of God reads, and it says, if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think I'll read that again. He says that if we confess, that means to say what it is, our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm going to use for a text this morning, grace to break the cycle of sin. Grace to break the cycle of sin. 
grace to break the cycle of sin. Grace to break the cycle of sin. Now, we live in a time now where everything is about a cycle. Everything is about something that is uh, not necessarily moving in the direction that many times we want to move into. So things have a tendency to cycle. If you look at the clothing situation, the clothing that people wear in today are some of the same clothing they wore when I was a young man growing up. So if you hang on to your outfit, it may go out of style. But if you hang on to it long enough, it'll come back into style. If you hang on long enough, it will come back into style. So... I want you to be reminded as we unpack this for a moment that we're going to deal with grace to break the cycle of your sins. Grace to break the cycle of your sin. Now, in Paul talked about his nature or his inward struggle with the sinful nature in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Paul said, the things that I want to do, I can't do, and the things that I don't want to do are the things that I find myself doing. Paul got so frustrated until he said something about himself that no Jew would say. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul got so frustrated until he had came to a certain conclusion. He said, the things I want to do, I, I, I find it difficult to do. And the things I don't want to do, I find it easy to do. And he said, I want to do this, but my flesh won't let me, and I want to do that. So he found himself battling with an inward struggle. So Paul surmised it in a way where he said, with my mind, I will serve God, and with my body, I will serve sin. And he found out in Romans 8 and 37, he says, nay, in all these things, Romans 8 and 37, he says, uh, I am more than a conqueror through him that loves me. In other words, he summed it up by simply saying that I can't win this sin on my own. I must have the grace and the power of God. So what I want you to get this morning, church, is that as pastor, I already know everybody in here is wrestling with something. I already know that you are dealing with something that you may at times feel or think that you can't control. But God told me to tell you that you have the grace to break the cycle of sin. Now, many believers go to church each Sunday with some inward struggle. You may be here today with an inward struggle just like Paul had. Maybe you're trying to stop smoking or stop drinking. Maybe you stop trying to steal or maybe you're, you're trying to stop lying. Maybe your struggle is that you're trying to just stop being a bad, mean-spirited person. Maybe you want to show more love and you find yourself that find it very, very difficult to show love because you've been wounded most of your life. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing that many times what people need and want the most is what they struggle with giving the most. You know, they want what they want, but they're not willing to give what they want. And as a result, their life just happened to, to be cycling. As you look up, they're going through one cycle to another. So Paul understood this. That's one thing about Paul. He understood that he was struggling. He understood that he was wrestling. He had an inward struggle. And cycling from week to week can be your inward struggle. Maybe, you're, maybe you are having an inward struggle with daily sins. And you come to church to get your emotional and your spiritual fix. So that as you leave the church, you can somehow feel in your subconscious mind that I'm better, I'm doing better, 
I feel better. I'm, this thing is not going to take me over, and, and I'm going to be all right. And, you, and, and you're wrestling with yourself. You know, there's no greater wrestling match or no greater critic of you than yourself. Oh, everybody else can talk about you, but don't nobody know you like you know you. Can the church say amen? Everybody else can hypothesize. They can make educational guesses about you, but they don't really know you like you know you. The greatest critic of every human being is the critic of oneself. How many of you know that you can do better than where you're at now? Raise your hand. If you really know, you got some more in you that you can do better. But see, when we know better, we should what? Do better. But if we don't do better, then that simply says we don't know as better as we think we know. So you ain't got to worry about nobody criticizing you, saying this about you. You do that better to yourself than anybody else could ever do it. Can the church say amen? Hallelujah. So I want you to understand that when you are cycling, the word cycle is a rotating circle. Are you going around in a rotating circle in your life? A cycle may be a way of feeling, thinking, behaving, or a combination of them all. A cycle can be a way of feeling, thinking, behaving, or a combination of them all. It's when somebody says something to you, do you go through your cycle? Is that, oh, here we go again? Uh, do you move from your feelings to your behavior? Or, or is it always about somebody hurt your feelings? Do you not realize that the devil will send people on assignment just to punch your feelings buttons? He always has somebody around you just, just to say something. You know, they, the devil will have somebody to say something that he know you don't like. So you think you're dealing with people, but you're dealing with the demons in people. <laughs> don't look at me like I'm strange. You know what we say, Ephesians 6 and 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Brothers and sisters, it is never your brother beside you. It is the demon that's inside of them that's causing you all of your problem. If you believe that, somebody shout amen. amen. So you're fighting the wrong folks. <laughs> you're arguing with the wrong folks. You know, the enemy really don't want you to hear this because, see, this is a revolutionary word, so he, he, sometimes he has the tendency to get in the equipment, amen? But we believe in that, that this is going to go through, and after it go through, you can get the CD and listen to it again, amen? So what I want you to gather is that even though you may be cycling, remember, a cycle is a rotating circle. Are you going around in a circle? <clears throat> You know, one minute you're doing good, next minute you're doing bad. If you find your life, you know, and, and some people don't understand that when they're going through cycles, God is not, the cycle is not your problem. The circle is not your problem. God is allowing you to go through the cycle so he can work something out in you. <laughs> you thought it was the journey, but it's really you. You thought it was the trouble, but it's really you. He said, I got to take you around this wilderness for 40 years to work Egypt out of you. <laughs> he said, I delivered you in a day, but I got to work, have you to go 40 years to get Egypt out your mind. It's amazing how God can give you something in a day, but you can be a slave to the stuff that went on to you as of tomorrow, as of yesterday. So your cycle is not your issue. God is trying to work something out in you. Can the church say amen? See, if the cycle is not controlled, it will control the person. The cycle feeds off itself. In other words, if you don't move into grace to break your cycle, the cycle will feed off of itself. For you know it, things are getting worse. See, uh, it can control you, 
rather than you controlling it. You think that you're catching hell now. Well, if you keep doing what you're doing, it can speed up. And you'll be praying for the hell you're catching today, for what the hell you'll be catching three, four months down the road. You may be in your best time right now. Oh, I know you ain't ready for this here. See, you may be in your best season today because God is trying to give you the wisdom to break forth from your cycle. And we're going to give you that. We're going to show you how to manage this thing, how to move forward in this thing, not let it control you. It can have a life of its own. There are some things you want to stop and you say, I can't stop it. And you feel like, well, I'm going I'm, I'm to do everything I can to stop it. How many of you have ever been there where you've been, you've been involved in something that you tried to stop it, but you couldn't stop it? And the more you tried to stop it, the, the quicker the cycle speeded up. That's called a high-speed cycle. Write that down. Are you high-speed cycling? It's when the cycle does not stay the same. It gets worse and worse, and it moves faster and faster. The things you used to take a month to do, you now take a couple of weeks. The things you used to take a couple of weeks to do, you now get done in an hour. Why? While you playing with the devil, he's trying to kill you. It's kind of like petting a wolf. You see the wolf as a pet, but the wolf see you as a meal. How many caught that? <laughs> see, you, you can't play with the devil. You got to decide that, that you're going to move on and you're not going to let that enemy come to destroy your life by whatever addiction you may be in. So the high speed cycle get worse and worse. The scripture tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 13, it says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, uh, being, deceived, uh, being deceived and being deceived, deceiving and being deceived. So sin doesn't get better, church. Sin get worse. If you don't kill what you in, it will kill you. You know how some people say, well, I got this under control, Pastor. I understand what you're saying. You know, I, you know, I got it under control, you know. I get it, you know. I, I got to do what I got to do. And these are people that uh, don't understand grace, and they're under the illusion of control. Well, I can stop it whenever I want to stop it, Pastor. I can stop it when I want to stop it. I know how I got into this. I know how I got started with this. You know, I can stop drinking when I want to stop it. Hallelujah. Help him out. I can stop drinking when I want to stop it. Both of y'all hold it. I can stop drinking when I want to stop it. You see, the enemy want to always try to get you to say you in control. And how many of you know that you're not in control? You can't control it. Every time the enemy make you feel like, well, you know, I'm going to stop this, and I'm going to stop that, and I'm going to use my willpower. I got willpower to do this and willpower to do that, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to shut this down, Pastor. I got it. I got it. How many of you have ever been there where you said, I'm going to shut this down? I got it. Now, naturally, when we talk about cycling of sin, perverted minds go to sex. That's what perverted mind does. Immediately go to sex. But when you understand that sin is not just sex, sin is having un unforgiveness in your heart and you won't forgive your brother or your sister. Sin is walking around with anger. Sin is walking around with wrath. Sin is walking around with malice. Sin is witchcraft. Sin is anything that goes against the word of God. Anything that transgresses against the word of God. Sin is knowing to do right, but choosing not to do it. That's sin. Are you cycling with something that you should have dealt with years ago? 
Are you a person that moves into feelings real quick? As soon as somebody say something, it's always about you. I used to talk to guys in my therapy groups, and I could tell the one that was sensitive and emotional. And normally sensitive and emotional people have been wounded. They have bruised, they have wounded spirits and bruised emotions. And they go through life with a lack of trust. In order to find happiness, they have to find it by putting someone else down in order to elevate themselves. That's sin. Can the church say that's sin? Are you cycling when people say things about you, are you cycling? Are you mad at what your mama did 10 years ago? Are you upset at what your husband did five years ago? Are you mad because you didn't get the last cookie out of the cookie jar? Do you feel like people are always picking on you? I'm here to tell you, church, if you do, you are emotionally cycling. Just can't serve God with your emotions. Believe me, I tried and then couldn't do it because there's always going to be tender spots. Write that down, tender spots. As a believer, you're going to have tender spots, those spots where people have hurt you in the past, and you'll find yourself guarding your tender spots. There are some believers who do not understand grace, and they say, well, you know, I can... I can stop sinning when I want to stop, and this is an illusion, a pipe dream. Defective thinking, thinking errors, and magical thinking. You know, if I do this, I can stop. If I do that, I can stop. See, if you could really stop sinning, there would be no need for the blood of Jesus Christ. Why send Jesus when you got it? Why send Jesus when you're the one that said, I can, I can shut it down whenever I want to. I don't need no grace. Get that grace to somebody else. I can shut it down whenever I want to. That's the person that cycles fast. You know why they go into a high-speed cycle? Because the moment you start to think that you're in control is a true indication that you're out of control. There are some who say, with my willpower, Pastor, with my will. Now, I, st- I stopped smoking for two years last time. I didn't do it. No, no, Jesus, I did it. I did it. Then why are you smoking now? Are you going to tell me that you just decided to start back? <laughs> or was the addiction strong enough to pull you back in? You see, you have no control over it. You, you have to rest. Look to your neighbor and say, rest. Rest. Rest in the grace. Because when you put forth your best effort and you think you're shutting some things down, I'm here to tell you, they're going to speed right back up. You got to say, Father God, I can't handle this. I can't do this here. It ain't on me. It's on you. You know where my heart is at. You know where my conscience is at. You know what I believe. You know I'm sick of this mess. I'm sick of this mess. I'm sick and tired of saying I'm sick and tired. Father God, I need you to do an intervention for me right now. Come on into my life and help me shut this mess down. Are you having a delusion? Of willpower, do or are you having magical thinking? Well, you know, you know, magical thinking says this here that uh, here's magical thinking at its best thought pattern. Magical thinking said, I can fly, I can fly. Uh huh, I can fly. I can fly just like the birds. I can fly higher than an eagle. Uh huh, I can fly faster than a swallow. <laughs> I can fly like the hawk. That's magical thinking. Magical thinking can take you to the top of the tallest building in the city. And your magical thinking can have you to leap with your arms spread it wide. And you run. Can everybody say run? You run and you leap off the building with magical thinking. I can fly. I believe I can fly. But 
What magical thinking does not do, it does not take into reality the law of gravity. <laughs> See, there's a law with your magical thinking. Is that when you take off, the law kicks in and says, I don't know what you're thinking, but my job is to pull you down. And you hit the pavement dead on arrival. Why? Magical thinking can get you in a place that even when God is trying to pull you out, he first got to change and renew your mind before he can help you like he really want to help you. So are you cycling with magical thinking? Are you asking God to do something for you that's not in the book? Are you running in pride? Is everything all prideful? Are you talking to God about stuff that happened last year? God said, I don't remember that. Are you talking about what they did last year? God said, I don't remember. Did you repent of that? That's what God said. He said you say, yeah, I repent. He said, I don't remember that. Are you talking about what you used to do versus what you do? God says, I don't remember that. I have no knowledge of that. He said, the moment you confess your sin, he said, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. He said, I throw it in the sea of forgetfulness. I don't remember that. What you talking about? God tell you what you talking about. I don't remember that. Isn't it amazing that when things happen to us, we go back to the garbage can? Stay with me now. We go back and look at what happened. You trying to find your past emotions. And you looking for stuff that God done got rid of. Because you can connect to the mess because you can't connect to where God is trying to take you. So you feel comfortable in the garbage can. Yeah, I remember they hurt me over here. They did that to me. I don't know. You know, I just don't feel right. I don't believe these people love me over here. They don't love me because I was hurt over here. That's called cycling. Can somebody say cycling? Are you cycling from past pains? Stuff that you should have let go long time ago. Okay, they lied on you, let it go. You got abused, let it go. You got raped, misused, let it go. Look to your neighbor and say, let it go. I can't hear you, church, say, let it go. You see, what you refuse to kill will kill you. Let it go. Okay, they took your money. They took the last $400 you had, and they went and brought some drugs with it, and you can't get your money back. Somebody say, let it go. Come on, now you got to say it like you know you mean it. Say, let it go. See, because if you don't let it go, you can't grow no more. Somebody say amen. You got to learn to let certain things go. You got to learn to let God be your source and don't cycle from thing to thing. Now, I'm going to share with you the 10 phases of your cycle. Be quick. I'm going to get through these. You say, well, preacher, I'm saved and I'm sanctified and I'm filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. And I do speak in tongues that the Spirit of God give me utterance. I'm saved. I got Jesus. I know the Lord. I'm a bishop. I'm a deacon. I sing in the choir. I ush. I play the keys, the salt and pepper. I'm the lead singer of the worship team. I'm minister of music. I'm the parking lot attendant. I know how to park them cars. Line up over here. No, no, you're too close to that one. Line up over there. Come on now. All right, watch them doors. Watch them doors. Now straighten it on up. Now mix bag up. Ho, ho, ho. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You almost hit that car and you got to listen to what I'm saying. Line that car on up like you need to line it up. They want to park a car. I'm the main man at the parking lot attendant. And I got my boys with me and they know how to park the car. We've been doing this for a minute when we all saved and we got Jesus. Deacons deep, usher earth, choir sing, preachers preach, bishop, bishop. And when you get through with all those titles, everybody 
wrestling with some. Oh, give God a hand praise in the house of God. Everybody wrestling with some. Even your kids wrestling with some. With their innocent self. So the question is, now that I'm saved, now that I'm sanctified, now that I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, now what? What do I do being saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm still sinning? Oh, uh, excuse me for those of you that don't sin anymore since you've been saved. I like to apologize to you because I know that when sometime when you are areoditis, when you have been tricked and bamboozled by your own self, <laughs> and we call that self-righteousness, when you believe that you ain't doing nothing wrong is an indication you're doing everything wrong. Somebody say amen. When you believe that you got it all together is an indication that you have nothing together. For those of you that, if this don't apply, let it fly. Right now, I'm preaching to some people that know that they're wrestling with something. We're not talking to the scribes and the Pharisees right now. We're not talking to the Sadducees and the publican because they got it all together. We're talking to the church, the same one that Paul was talking to. And I believe once you get these 10 keys that your life will never be the same because you're going to know how to live for Christ while being infected with this skin of sin. It will be something if I could pull it off and throw it in the back somewhere, you know, just jump out of the, the skin of sin and say, okay, now I'm holy, but I can't do that. I can't, I can't do that. So, so I am instructed to modify the deeds of my flesh. And the word modify means to put to death. So how many know that there are some sins that you can kill, but they will rise again? See, if you've been abused, you're going to be fighting up that abuse, that victimization until you die. Just get used to it. It ain't the devil. It has been lodged in your conscience. It has been lodged in your repertoire. And whatever is there is permanently there. You cannot delete the button. You, you can't hit the button and it's gone. You learn how to live with it and keep it under your feet so it does not become the primary in your life. When it becomes the primary in your life, you are living your life from a victim's stance. And if you live your life from a victim's stance, everything that happened to you, you rewind back to your original pain. And you see life through painful eyes. Your tendency is to get mad real quick because you're saying, why are all these bad things happening to me? And God that was 50 years ago, a God that was three years ago, a God that was 10 years ago, why haven't this left? God says that my grace <laughs> is sufficient. So, so you wonder, well, why did this happen? So after you're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, can everybody say I'm saved, I'm sanctified, and I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, and I still got some issues? Oh, now we're on the same page now. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Here's what the devil like to do to you. After you have committed a sin, be it willful or unwillful or you just, you know, got into it, you know, you woke up and you said, how I get here? How I get in this room with this naked woman? How, who 
took off all my clothes? <laughs> How did this happen? What am I doing up in here? Or you find yourself at the bar. Who put this drink in my hand? What this drink doing in my hand? Who put this joint in my hand? What? 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 Why am I puffing this joint? You know why you're doing it? Because you want to. Stop blaming your friend. You know what you're doing. You have allowed yourself to become a dog, a dog, a dog. A dog is one that goes back to his vomit. When God has brought you out of something, you got to fight to stay out of it. He don't bring you out of it so you can return back to it. You got to fight. You got to fight to stay out of it. Ain't no such thing as that, well, you know, I've been gone a long time. I haven't smoked no joint, haven't drank nothing, haven't been to the club, haven't done none of that, man. It's been by, you know, it's been a minute, man. It's been by, you know, what it been? It's been a minute. It's been a minute. It's been about two years, and this is where I'm going to reward myself. You're a towel going back to your vomit, and you need to stop it. How are you going to be saved and just keep doing the same thing? So even after you do it, number one, the pretend righteous phase. You ain't got to pretend. Okay, you became the dog. You went back, sucked on the joint, drunk up the place, met the girl at the club, went to the hotel, motel, holiday inn. You went all over the place. You did your thing. After you did it, now you come into church and you look stoic, Trying to pretend that you're righteous. I, and, and, and under your breath, say, I just pray to God that nobody here in the church see me. I pray to God they didn't see me. See, it's amazing how we can focus on man seeing us, but never focus on the all seeing eye that see you. Isn't that amazing? You worrying about human beings seeing you. Did Fred see me? Did the pastor see me? Did anybody in the church see me? Well, I'm good. They didn't see me. Okay, God, I know you got me. Holler back. I know you got me. But uh, as long as these Negroes didn't see me, I'm good. Which it should be in reverse. It should be, you should be terrified that God is going to see you because he's the one that has the power to judge everything you do. So God told me to tell you, number one, you don't have to come into church and to pretend righteous. You're made right. Number one, we have grace to be righteous. Because we've been made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and 2. Romans 5 and 19 said, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. We are made right. So I don't have to pretend after I get through sinning and grinning, when I come to church on Sunday or Wednesday, as long as I repent of my sins, I can walk in here and say I'm the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Now, there's an enemy that wants you to feel guilty about it. Say, now, you know, boy, you clown. The devil, the devil, you were surprised the devil with some of your activity. The devil said, I ain't know you had that in you, boy. The devil said, where that come from? Why? Because the enemy wants you to focus on what you did and not on what Christ has already done. Oh, isn't that a beautiful thing? <laughs> Who don't want to be saved today is crazy. Say it's finished. I can't hear you. Say it's finished. See, it's done. He's already died for every sin that I did in the past. Every sin I'll do today. He died for every sin that I will do. It's finished. So you don't have to pretend righteous. You're made righteous through Jesus Christ. He still is in love with you. So number one, we have the grace to be righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ who made us right. Hallelujah. 
He made you right. It's not about what you do. It's about what he has already done. Will the church say amen? Number two, we have the grace to know our triggers. Do you know what gets you started? Do you know, do you know what turns you on? See, immediately you went sexual. But do you know what turns you on? What causes you to lie? Is it self-protecting lies? Do you lie because you're trying to protect yourself? Do you always want to look good? Are you telling self-protecting lies? Is it ego lies? What are ego lies? Somebody said, my car can go 120 miles an hour. You said, my car can go 150. But your speedometer says 80. That's called an ego lie. How many hear what I'm talking about? Your car ain't even designed to go 150. How many remember them cars that were designed to go 80, 80 miles per hour? That was it, 80. So you with your friend said, he said, well, my car can go 160 miles an hour. Other friends said, mine can go 120. And, and you're going to top everybody. Well, mine can go 180. When all your car can do is 80. That's called a ego lie. Do you tell a lot of ego lies? Do you have to always be the best? Is lying a trigger for you? When you walk by the store and you see those beer cans, is that a trigger for you? When you're around people that like to play these social games, is that a trigger for you? Do you feel good when you go in the club? Do you get those endorphins? Do your, do, your, do your system of endorphins and neurons, do they get excited? Do your frontal lobe of your mind jump up and down and says, I'm back, I'm back. Are you happy because you're in the wrong place? What are your, what are your triggers? You left it, but you back to it. You know, there are some people that you shouldn't be around because when you're around them, it's amazing how you become the fool. Are you with me? How you can be around somebody that, you know, that you know that intellectually your quotient is greater than how you act. How many here what God is telling you? Your quotient is greater than how you act. But when you're with them, you become a chihuahua. You know what a chihuahua does when he's faced with a German shepherd? He exposes his fronts. He lays down and kicks his legs up, yielding to the greater dog. Because if the chihuahua act like he want to say something back with his little bark, you know, the, the, the big dog may kill him, grab him and shake him. Are you, you got the big dog in you. Why are you acting like a chihuahua? Meaning that sometimes we, we act like chihuahuas when we really are great dames. Do you want to fit in that much that you would, Dumb down yourself to be a part of a stupid clique. I'm just going to dumb down. They, they ain't got to know I'm saved. They ain't got to know I got Jesus. Uh -uh, I'm going to dumb down. I'm just going to get in and fit in. You know, you got to have some friends. I ain't got no friends. I ain't got no friends. You know, I need some friends. I ain't got no friends in the church. I ain't got no friends at work. Ain't got no friends. Now, if you ain't got no friends in church, you ain't got no friends in the work. It's not your friends, baby. Come on now. Come on. Got more to do with you. Why? The scripture says, he who has friends must what? Show. That means to expose yourself. Must show himself friendly. So if people don't naturally gravitate to you, maybe there's something about you that they don't want to be around. But as kingdom citizens, as believers, all of us should be showing ourselves friendly. So you can cycle that in the world. How the, how, how the, how the world have brought their stuff to the church and we got believers acting like non-believers. That's, that's cycling. Somewhere along the line, that person got to die. 
You got to kill that person that don't know their triggers now. So what I'm saying is that before uh, you didn't sin, right? Now you don't have to come to church and pretend righteous. You are righteous. You ain't got to pretend it. You are righteous. Now the devil is going to try to get you to act up again. So he's going to throw some stuff at you and those are your triggers. What are your triggers? What are those things that cause you to sin? What are those things that cause you to feel inferior? What are those things that cause you to lie? What are those things that cause you to commit adultery? What are those things that cause you to move into witchcraft? What are those things that cause you to be in, in control? What are those things that cause you to get into anger? What are those things that trigger the works of your flesh? You got to know your triggers. You got to know. The scripture tells us to examine ourselves. Grace will remove all of your triggers. Grace will remove all of your defective thinking, thinking errors and magical thinking. Hear this, church. One single thought can cause an avalanche of sin. How many of you know what an avalanche is? One single thought can cause an avalanche of sin in your life. I didn't say three thoughts. I didn't say two. I said one. You know why it can cause an avalanche of sin in your life? It's because Satan has psychologically got you that have connected dots with past sins and once one thought trigger the sin factor, then all the past sins run like an avalanche. They come to that thought aid. Is this making sense? Y'all don't mind if I go therapeutic with you, see? I'm, 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 I'm trying to get you to understand that, that it's a battle you can't win, but you can manage. Know your triggers. When some people say something to you that you don't like, and, and people used to say it years ago, you know, one thing that I didn't like when they was talking about me, they said, look at you, little black Johnny. You know, you got the nappy hair. They talked about me like a dog. I had to learn to embrace that. Don't run from it. Embrace it. Because the enemy will use things to hurt you or try to hurt you to get you to hurt people back. We're not in the business to hurt people back. The scripture says, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. How many understand that? So don't cycle. Don't allow the devil to get you cycle. Know your triggers. Number three, we have the grace to help us to stop planning to sin. Why are you planning to commit sin? You remember I told you last week in Bible study, if you're planning to sin, don't expect to win. We have grace to interrupt our plans. If you're planning to sin, your thinking is out of control. Get that now. If you're planning to sin, your thinking is out of control. The devil would like to get you to go back to that thought. And then he, he wants to start you with hallucinogenic rehearsal. Hallucinogenic rehearsal simply says that I'm planning to do what I want to do when I get with you. How many caught that? I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. That's hallucinogenic rehearsal. In other words, you haven't done it yet. Sometimes hallucinogenic rehearsal can be like it's already done, but you haven't done it yet. When the devil started to play the tape back in your mind, he, he started to give you thoughts and feelings and behavior. You got to scream loud, no, I'm not doing that anymore. Sometimes you got to holler and say, I'm not doing that. Satan, you a lie. I don't do that anymore. How many of you ever had to get to that level, you know, where you had to scream to yourself? Uh, by the way, uh, if you haven't, you will. Okay? <laughs> now, that's if you really, really want to shut some down. Uh, the moment the thought come to you, you got you to gotta talk to that thing. You got you to gotta rebuke the Satan. You a, you a lie. I don't do that no more. I'm going to hear what God is telling you. So we have grace to help us to stop planning to sin. If you're planning to sin, your thinking is out of control. Romans 12 and 2 says, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. God ain't going to do that for you. 
He's not going to come down, okay, I, I got a bad one. Let me go in here and straighten him out. Click, 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 click. You're good. See, some of us who want him to do that, dog, God, why can't you just fix me? Why can't you just help me, God? You know what I'm doing. You know I don't like it, but I do like it. You know I don't like it. Oh, Lord, I love it. You know I don't, you know, and, and you're going through this stuff, and God says, I'm not doing nothing because what you can control, why would I try to stop? It's hard to kill what you love. Uh huh. See, it's hard to put a stake in the heart of something that you love. Because if it's drugs, it, it don't talk back to you. It says, it says I'm here and I'm available. Uh huh. <laughs> the drug said, I'll be your hunkerberry. That thing that'll come upon you, and before you know it, You'll get more pleasure dealing with objects, circumstance, or event than you will with human beings. This is why today we got people marrying dogs. What if the dog say, you make me sick, I can't stand you anymore. Ruh, 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 ruh. <laughs> then the dog would sound too much like a person, so guess what would happen? They'll get divorced. Fido got his divorce papers. Roo, 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 roo. Fussing. Roo, 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 roo. <laughs> roo, 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 roo. Roo, 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 roo. <laughs> but since the dog can't talk back, who's in control? It's all about control. So, what are your triggers? What is controlling you? Don't plan to sin. Number four. We have the grace to stop up the build-up phase of sin. This is when believers cannot harness his thoughts and feelings. It is his own lust. Unchecked desires become the controlling factor. Have you ever been in a situation where you just made it up in your mind, you know what, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to do what I got to do. Uh -huh. I, I, I don't I don't waste all this fantasy, this planning, hallucinogenic rehearsal. Uh -uh, no, no, no. I know I got to go to church, but I ain't going to church. I'm going to do what I got to do. That's the build-up phase. The build-up phase simply says, number four, the build-up phase, we have the grace to stop the build-up phase. It simply says, I don't care what the consequences are. I got to do what I got to do. Pacifying out, so what? I'm grown. How many of you know some people like that? I'm, I'm a grown man. I can do what I want. Ain't nobody going to be telling me when I can do something, where I can go, and how I can go. But I don't do that anyway, you know, because I know grown folks are going to do what grown folks want to do. It's not me that you got to obey. You need to obey God. I'm just an under shepherd. And if you can't obey me, I know you ain't obeying God. Amen? So the build of faith simply says this here, is that I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, where I want to do it, who I want to do it with. And that's it. And then got the nerve to so that I'm grown and I'm still saved. Now you need to be careful with that last one you say. Because <laughs> in the Old Testament, people just flopping and dropping. They drop dead. Remember I said last week, you got to cooperate with the grace. So what do you do in the build-up phase? Here's what I want you to think about. In the build-up phase, you need to have something that can interrupt that phase. It, it's probably one of the most critical and dangerous phase. You're you at the point where your lust is so unchecked that you really don't care about the consequences. There are people that do things they don't even care about getting caught. I did it. Then they worry about the consequences after they do it. That's where the devil wants you at. But you can use thought stoppers in the build up phase. Find a way to say words that can block your thoughts. You heard me say be before, uh, you know, that, um, that mosquitoes uh, can drive Cadillacs. You have to use something that's going to 
deflect your thinking of where you're at. Dogs sing in choirs, anything. Something that can get your mind off of thinking about what you want to do. Birds fly with Superman, anything. Something that can trigger your mind off of what you're thinking on. They are called thought stoppers, some intervention, something that can intervene. And you'll be thinking about, mosquitoes drive pink Cadillacs? Wow, I didn't know that. Can they really drive them? Now you don't stop thinking about that perverted thing you wanted to do. Because now your mind is on, can mosquitoes really drive pink Cadillacs? And if you don't want to use those star stoppers, then how about in the name of Jesus? I got the blood. How about my God shall supply all of my needs? I can do all things through Christ that strengthened me. How about I'm the head and not the tail? I don't do that anymore. Can somebody say, I don't do that anymore? Even if you're doing it, got the joint in your hand, you need to test, I don't do this. I don't know why it's joint in my hand, but I don't do this anymore. Throw that thing down. I don't do that anymore. I don't drink anymore. I don't lie anymore. I don't cuss anymore. I don't do that anymore. Your mouth got to say it because what your mouth say, your ears hear, you start to believe. I don't do that anymore. I'm just trying to help you. While I'm helping myself, you have to say, I don't do that anymore. So you can stop the build-up phase. Number five, we have grace to stop the impulsive rush phase. The impulsive rush phase of sin. In this phase, the believer needs an intervention because the believer may not care about consequences. So the build-up and the impulsive rush kind of run the same way. I got to do it. Did you not know the only reason why they have the candy at the cash register? They have your favorite goodies at the cash register. Notice that they don't have chicken up there, right? Because you got to cook that. They don't have canned goods up there, right? Because you got to open up the can and pour all the stuff out. You ain't got time for all that. Impulsive rush want what it want when he want it right now. Before you make it to the car, you putting them M&Ms in your mouth. Click, click, click. Car just right outside. You done got it on the impulsive rush and paying for it while opening up the bag and then stuff the whole bag down your mouth for you make it back to your car. That's impulsivity. They are counting on you with the impulsive rush, just like the devil is counting on you to move in your impulsivity to commit sin. That's why you have certain things available. Did you not know the devil will market to you? See, he'll give you everything you want. He's really kind of like them old school crack dealers and, and them cocaine dealers. They was, you know, smart back in the day. Now, some of them, I don't, I don't, I don't know what you call them now, but I know back in the day, I mean, they'll pull up in a town and, and rent out a hotel room for 30 days. And they would have their little stash, and, and they just get to you. Huh, you want some more? Huh. Take all you want. Get, get all you want. No, 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 This for her. Get that. You need some more? Come on in. Got a line of people giving out free dope. Are oh, you getting free cocaine? Yes, you are. Now, once you get good and hooked, <laughs> oh, you got to pay for this. So now the price go through the roof. And that's how they establish their strongholds in cities and towns. You thinking you're getting something free, not knowing you're going to pay for it later. That's how the devil does. He makes what you love accessible to you. He makes it accessible. He makes time blocks where nobody knows it's just you. It's just you. You and whatever you do. Ain't, ain't nobody going to be around. He makes it all accessible to you. So as long as it's accessible to you, it's easy for you to do it. Not knowing that it is not the accessibility that he's looking for. He want you. He want to destroy you. 
And then when he gets you all hooked and got you all in your thing, then he brings lights, camera, action. Reporters come from everywhere. Uh, excuse me, sir, are you the Reverend Wright, Reverend Dr. So-and-so? Do you pastor church on, on such and such block? Are you a member of, of such and such church? Are you a person that's been working at such and such place? See, see, he loved to give you what you want to expose you later. Can somebody say, I'm not falling for that? See, if, if it come easy, there's a hook to it. So number five, we have grace to stop the impulse of rush to sin. Number six, we have grace not to act out. One thing about sin, sin brings with it a grooming phase. A grooming phase is that to set it up becomes more attractive than the actual act itself. How some people that go out and commit sin, they commit adultery, they commit all kind of stuff, and, and they get drunk and they do crazy stuff. They would tell you that, man, it was more fun getting to it than actually doing it. See, sin know how to romance you. That's why they have all those commercials. All of that is grooming you. I know years ago, you know, uh, me and my partners, you know, we would be at home and we'd be watching those programs. Back then they had Soul Train and Soul Train came on on Saturday morning. Sometimes it came on in, in the evening and we'd be watching Soul Train and they'd do the Soul Train line. And, uh, and we would watch that program knowing that we're going out Saturday night. So what we trying to do is get some moves. You know, we looking at what they're doing, got the hat. Back then they had them apples on. They had, had a hat to throw all out, and they doing their thing, going down the Soul Train line and all this stuff. We watching because we're going to do the same thing at the club. How many have been there? A am I dating myself? See, we're we going to do the same thing at the club. So what the Soul Train program was doing was grooming us before we went out. How they had that boom farm and that Jack Daniel and all that stuff. You know, you take your little sip and do this here and, and post to make you more ready for the ladies. Somebody say amen. Well, see, that's how the devil do you. He'll groom you before he use you. He would allow you to groom yourself with the sin that you're in. And you'll convince yourself that what you're doing is okay. See, he, his whole objective is to give you as much pleasure as you want. Because it is the pleasure that caused you to get hooked. What you talking about? 15, 18, 12 seconds shake for a permanent disruption of your life? Somebody got it, somebody didn't. <laughs> Let me say it again, a 15 or 18 or 12 second shake for something that's going to mess up your life permanently. Is it worth it? But the enemy will, will give you all the pleasure you want. Hear me, church, just to destroy your life. So when you act out in sin, here's what when you act out in sin, here's what you're doing. The act of sin is the ultimate selfish rebellion against the authority of God. It is the ultimate selfish rebellion against the authority of God. Number seven, we have grace to build, grace to build us up when we do sin. So if you happen to go out and do something wrong, you got grace to build you up. The enemy wants you to feel condemnation, shame, guilt, and fear. With grace, we have no condemnation, no shame, no fear. We know we are still loved by God, and we are the righteousness of God. That's even after you sin, even after you lie, even after you cheat, even after you commit adultery, even after you've done some crazy stuff. God is still reaching for you. So we have grace to build us up when we do sin. That's number seven. Number eight, 
We have grace not to walk in the great promise, the so-called great promise. You know, some people, when they do wrong, they say, I ain't going to do this no more. I promise I'm not going to do this no more. They tell their wife, they tell their husband, they tell their kids, they tell the person that they violated, and you can take it to the bank, I'm not going to do this no more. They even tell themselves, I am not going to smoke that joint no more. I'm not going to the club anymore. I'm not going to do these crazy stuff anymore. I know that's wrong. I'm not doing it anymore. And while saying it, they mean it. Only to discover that the cycle is too strong. And they find themselves back in it. So the question is that they really mean it when they said it. Of course they did. That's why he gave us his grace. Because he know we can't stop doing some things on our own. And the only way we can truly stop it is through his grace. So we have grace not to make the great promise. Why well, promise something that you know you can't keep? Only God would be the one that would keep it for you. He's the one that has already made it up in his mind to die for your sins. So all you have to do is just say, you know, I'm believing God for the day that his grace is going to keep me today. Don't think about tomorrow. Think about the day. God, I'm, I'm believing you to keep me today. I'm surrendering to a power that's greater than myself, and that's God. He loved me too much to keep me where I am. So no more promises. I'm moving in his grace. Amen? Number nine, we have grace not to justify, minimize, or rationalize our sins. Just admit it. Say, I'm sorry. We don't have to justify or minimize or rationalize it. Justify and say, well, you know, I, I had to do what I had to do. Minimize and say, it wasn't that bad. Rationalize and say, I didn't hurt nobody. You know, sinners got all kind of slick words. But we have grace not to do it. Romans 5 and 8 says, but God commanded his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we don't have to justify nothing. We don't have to minimize it. We don't have to rationalize it. It's already paid for. Amen? And the last one, we have grace so we don't have to feel condemned after we sin. See, the reason, the reason why you feel condemned is because you're saved now. Being saved, you can't commit a sin and just be happy about it. How many understand what God is telling you? When you're really saved, you cannot commit a sin and say, wow, that was good. I, I want to do that again. When you really say, you can say, wow, I went to the club and I partied. That was the best party I had in a long time. There's something that's going to happen to you because that thing in you. How many know about that thing that's in you? That thing in you is going to say, now you know this was wrong. That thing in you is going to say, this ain't what we do. That was the old man. You're now the new man. You cannot commit sin when you get saved and enjoy it. There's no enjoyment in it. It may be for a moment, but, the, but that Holy Spirit going to convict you and the devil going to condemn you. The Holy Spirit is going to say, you know that was wrong. The Holy Spirit is going to say, you said you weren't going to do that no more. The Holy Spirit is going to say, you know you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have been there. The Holy Spirit is going to bring conviction to you. The Holy Spirit is not going to just let you enjoy it because the Holy Spirit job is to change you. But the devil going to condemn you. He said, here we go again. That's you again, ain't it? I knew you wouldn't really saved. I knew you didn't turn your life over to Christ. You need to stop playing with them people and going back out into the world. Why are you lying to everybody, trying to make people think you got Jesus, and you know you don't? He's going to throw everything at you to condemn you. The difference is you got to know which voice is talking to you at the time the voice is talking to you. If you feel convicted, that's the Holy Spirit saying, that is not you. 
If you feel condemned, the devil is saying, you ain't saved. You ain't trying to live right. You ain't trying to do this here. I don't even know why you're going to church. What you going to church for? You know you can't live this. That's the devil. So after you sin, which one is talking to you? And if you heard the word today, God has given you an answer on how to break the cycle of sin. The first place I would start is your thought pattern and the triggers. When you start getting those thoughts and those triggers start to happen, you got to talk to that thing. Tell that devil, no, I don't do that no more. Uh Uh-uh. Then call on Jesus. The word Yeshua means salvation. Jesus means salvation. He didn't just save you to get to heaven. He saved you to live in the earth. So every time something starts to happen, just call his name. Can somebody say Jesus? Come on, say Jesus. That means that he's coming to save you. He got to operate according to his name. So when you start having those triggers, those impulsive rush, those buildup and those sin things that come into your mind, just scream Jesus. Jesus, I need help. Jesus, save. And God will come in and remove that thought. Have you ever, have you ever thought had a good thought and you kept on thinking and it left and you couldn't find it again? How many of you ever had, a, had a, a powerful great thought and it vanished? Well, see, how did it vanish? Your mind went to another thought. Well, now, if you got an evil thought, God can take your mind to another thought where you won't dwell on that evil thought. That evil thought will vanish. You got to pray to God and ask God to take those evil thoughts out of your mind. And he would do that by thought interruption. Have you ever had a great thought and your kid came and started asking you questions? Great thought. Okay. Or you at school or, or wherever and somebody asked you a question and that great thought you had, if you didn't spit it into the, uh, into the uh, recorder or write it down, where did it go? It's gone. Just like it can be gone with great thoughts, it also can be gone with evil thoughts. And you have to ask God to help you to get rid of those evil thoughts so that it won't lead you to sin. Amen? If you receive that, give God a hand praise in the house of God as you stand to your feet. So you have grace to win, not to be defeated. How many understand this grace that we're talking about in this grace series? Once you get through, once we get through this whole series, you shouldn't be losing. You should be winning. You have grace to win. Grace to win. God did not give you grace so you can be defeated. He gave you grace so you can win. And I want you today, as you leave here today, I want you to have in your mind that I'm winning and that when the enemy brings those thoughts when he try to get you to go into those garbage cans, he try to get you to live your life emotionally, he try to get you to spin out, just tell the devil, no, I'm a new creation in Christ. I have grace to win, and I will not plan to sin. The worst thing you can do is be a believer and set a date to sin because you're telling God you're not my authority. Self becomes the authority. Amen? Is there one here this morning that after hearing the word of God, maybe you're not saved and you want to be saved, you can come on down and receive Christ as your personal Savior. Is there one here this morning that need any prayer, if you need some prayer?